So we'll say my goal for today is we'll start on Daf Vav Omid Alpha on the bottom, and we'll see if we can make a little progress in the sugya, and then we'll look into a an insight of the COVID Saaris in the back and neighbor of Khan. So the Gemara says, and this is on Daf Vav Omid Aleph, about seven lines up from the bottom of the Omud. It says, And this is where Rashi puts forward his thesis that in the case of Yibum, you can fulfill your obligations as a Yavam without violating the Erev of Achos Ishto, and that's through Chalitza. That was Rashi's understanding of Hechshev Mitzvah. And what that means is the following. If we plug it in, to our Shakavataria, according to Rashi's understanding of Heksha Mitzvah, it says, Tepukle me hasam. You have that? It's about uh, seven lines up before the end of Dafoma Manalaf, which means that we could derive from the mitzvah Kibbut Av that it's not Docha Shabbos even though it's a heksha mitzvah, meaning it's impossible to fulfill my obligation of kibbutz without violating the shops. I have to cook, etc., for my father. But now we have another pasuk, which was quoted a little bit earlier on the daf, and that was about 10 lines down from the top. That was the pasuk, Mikdachai Tiro An Yashem. Now, if we would assume that Mikdashi Tiro is likewise a case of Heksha Mitz, which logically we should make that assumption, how can you build a base on Bigdash without violating the Shabbos? You have to pile the stones one on top of the other, which is Blechus Bonan. So then, why would the Torah need two Psukim, both of which say, or at least Adi Hashem? And last time we looked up those Psukim. And basically, you're repeating the same thing over and over again. You're telling me that even though it's a Heksha mitzvah, it does not override the Shabbos, neither in the case of Kibbut Av, nor in the case of Binyan Beis Hamigdash. So since we don't need a second time around, it's redundant. We already derived from Kibbut Av Ha'em and that passage where it says, Hashem Tzolsi Tishmarni Hashem, that Kibbut Avraim does not override the Shabbos in a case of Heksha Mitzvah. We don't need another possible to teach you again that you don't override the Shabbos for the sake of the Mitzvah of, of Binyan Beis Hamikdash in a case of Heksha Mitzvah, where it's impossible to fulfill the Mitzvah of Binyan Beis Hamikdash without violating the Easter of Shabbos. Therefore, since it's redundant, we're now going to derive the conclusion that even in a case where it's not a Heksha mitzvah, like for example, Yibu, where the option according to Rashi is Alitza, there's no Dechia Salah. And we don't know that you could override a Lav Sheesh Bokares, even in a case where it's not a Heksha mitzvah, for example, Yibu. And the Iser of Achos Ishto could be or might be overridden by the essay of Yibo. And that would be a possibility even in a case where it's not a Hatsha Mitz because we derive that from S. Mikdashi Tiro, which was a redundant re repetition. And therefore, we're going to talk about a lot of Shiyesh Bokarets. Why? Because in the case of Shabbos, whether it's Kibbut Av or it's a case of Binyan Beis Hamikdash, we're talking about overriding the Shabbos, which is a lav chesh bokaris. And the Torah is telling us that we do not override the Shabbos, even in a case of Heksha Mitzvah, for the sake of the Mitzvah Kibbut Av or Binyan Beis Hamikdash. But let's say, for example, the Lav Sheish Bokaris of Achos Ishto, that we could override 
because of uh, the mitzvah of Yibum, even though it's not a Heksham mitzvah, despite the fact that he has the option of Chalitza. And at this point in the Mahalach, in the development of the Sugya, the Gemara thinks that now we have ample justification for the extra word Olel to preclude Yivam in the case of Achos Ishto, because if not for the word Olel, we would have derived from the two Ani Hashems regarding Shabbos, that Shabbos is the exception to the rule, and ain't an essay, whether it's Kibbut Ab, whether it's Binyam Beis English, Dochel Losus Hashesh Bokares, but if it would have been a different Lav, for example, the Lav Achos Ishto, then Enochidami, an essay would override a loss. So despite the fact that it's a loss of Shiesh Bokaris, and despite the fact that it's not a Hefshim Mitzvah. Okay, so at least we got by Rashi's understanding of this line in the Gemara. Now the Gemara wants to reject the entire Elfusa from Binya Beis Hamikdash. The Gemara says, Enochinami, you're right, I don't need a Pasuk, I need a Shem to teach me that it's also to build the Beis HaMikdash on Shabbos. We've already derived that conclusion from Kibbut Av, which doesn't override the Shabbos. And Kibbut Av does not override the Shabbos, even though it's a Heksheb Mitzvah situation. And therefore, I could not override the Lav of Shabbos for the sake of, of Beis, Binya Beis HaMikdash, even though it's a Heksheb Mitzvah situation. And now you can ask me, so what is the need for the extra poskani Hashem in the parish of Esmikdach Aitiro? And that's what the Gemara spells out now. And the Gemara answers me, So now we're about to learn a Brisa. Now let's just make the Cheshmer before we even see the Brisa. What the what, what point in the Shakla Vitaria, where in the map is the Gemara holding based on the Brisa that we're about to learn? This Brisa is going to justify the need for Ani Hashem in the case of Binya Beis Hamikdash on Shabbos to block Binya Beis Hamikdash on Shabbos and Purim. And this Brisa is going to answer the question: Why do I need such a pasuk if, in any event, I can derive that from the fact that Kibbut Av is not does not override the Shabbos? So we have Es Mikdash Aitiro Ani Hashem in the parasha of Kibbut Av. Why then do I need the, the same identical Yalfusa in the case of Binya Beis Hamikdash overriding the Shabbos, meaning that we block it and you cannot override the Shabbos? Why do I need that? So we want to suggest we need it in order to teach us that even in a case where there's no Heksha Mitzvah, we still would apply Essegophilos and justify a love. But now they're going to say, no, 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 no. Forget about it learning anything from Binya based things. I need the Pasuk Ani Hashem in the parsha of Binya based on English for an entirely different reason. And that's the Bryce. So that's what this Bryce is going to do. So just keep in mind that at this point in the Gemara, we're back to square one, which means we're still in the dark and we haven't been able to justify the Pasuk of Leha in the case of Yibun with Rachos Ishto. And that's because the only source from which I would derive the opposite conclusion, meaning that essay would be is a case of Heksham Mitz. Okay, now we'll try to plow through this price. Yachol Yisyare Adam Mimigdash. Now here, I have a tosis, Dibra Maskel Yachol, which is actually printed on the next page, and he says, Gabi Itzri, Gabi Migdosh Itzri. You see, that's the third line down on Tosus Baba Mitbeis. And what is that? So he says, going back, Gabi Avivlohitzrich Lomar Kane, we're going to use the Posketch of Sosetich to teach me that Kibbutz does not override the shops. Why not use the Posset of Eshab Sosetich Moru? to teach me that we don't say Yisyare Adam me'avivi'ima. So, if I had a 
No, I don't have the time for this, but if I had the time, I would look for a black marker. Just write down on your page, Yisyare Adam Me. Mem meaning the first prefix of the word. Now we're going to need the pasuk of Ani Hashem with regard to Mikdash Tiro, because in Mikdash Tiro we have a Havamina of Yisyare Adam Me, and here we're going to fill in the word Mikdash. Yisyare Adam Me Mikdash. I'm going to try to decipher what that magical old phrase means. But Tos is pointing out, I don't need the Pasuk Ani Hashem with regard to Kibbut Av, because in the midst of Kibbut Av, there's no possibility, logically, of calling it Yachol Yisyare Adam Mi Aviv. Okay, now, what does it mean, Yisyare Adam? And why does it apply in the case of Migdash, but not in the case of Kibbut? Also says, Gabi Aviv Lo Hutzach Lomar came. The Pshita Shelo, and now he's explaining what Yisyare Adam May Aviv would have meant. Shelo Yishtachu Lo L'Shem Elokus. So Yachal Yisyare Adam would mean bowing down. Now, believe me, without this Tosis, I would have no clue what the Gemara is talking about. Avil Gabi Migdash Ister. There is a Havim. Why? Because the Migdash is a Darvish of Kedusha. It's the highest level of Kedusha that we have. And there was a Havah meaning that I should bow down to an object that is vested with Kedusha. And when I say a Havah meaning, in our methodology, the way we were taught, a Havah meaning is to be taken seriously. It's not just some Joe from the street, you know, says, oh, let's bow down to the base of Migdash. But there was a real Havah meaning. In fact, inside the Beis Hamikdash, there is a mitzvah v'shta'avu. And when we get close to the Shechina and we enter into the Migdash, we bow. But now we're talking about somebody who's standing outside the Beis Hamikdash. He's bowing down to the edifice itself. And there's a serious halamina that a person would bow down to the Beis Hamikdash. But in the case of Aviv, you're talking about a human being. And if you were to bow down to a human being, you would be making that person into a deity. There's no harm, you know, that I can bow down to a human being. By the way, P.S. In the case of Yoshua, it seems that he bowed down to a Malach. You remember that? Halonu l'chaim l'tzarenu? You know, what is it? The fifth paragraph of Yoshua, wherever it is. <laughs> I mean, the post can have a hard time reading that post because we don't bat down to a mouth either. Inami gabi over shaykh mora shalo yachi senu. When the Torah uses the word mora vis a vis a father, I can interpret that literally. I don't have to go on to a high level and say, well, you should bow down to your father. You don't bow down to your father. Yira, in the case of your father, means mora of it. And mora of it means I have to do whatever I can to keep my father smiling and not incur his wrath. But in the case of Migdash, which is an inanimate object, the structure of the Migdash, ain't a yachol limso el farish vaholik. Okay, so we're going to try to eventually fill in the blanks that there is such a thing as mora Migdash. But right now, we don't know what mora Migdash is. So therefore, we think that maybe mora Migdash when the Torah actually says, Umikdashi Tiro, how do you fulfill that mitzvah of Mikdashi Tiro? By bowing down to the base of the Mikdash. And it teaches me that we don't bow down to the base of Mikdash. So let's read the Bryce again. Emra Shmira Bishabis, the Nemra Mora Bimigdash, Ma Shmira Hamura Bishabis, Lomi Shabbos at the Yore, Ella Mimisha Hizir Al Shabbos. Right, I'm going to use a phrase that makes no sense, but just to convey a message, we don't bow down to the Shabbos. 
we bow down to Hashem who gave us the Shabbos and sanctified the Shabbos. And so too, within the context of this equation, this analogy, af mora, in the case of mora migdash, which is written in the same parish, if you remember, Lomi Migdash Atmo Atomis Yore Ella Mimisha Hizir Al Hamigdash. So now it means that Mora Migdash, as opposed to our Havamina, does not imply or obligate me to bow down to the structure of the Migdash. And that I know from the Aniyah Shem that's written in the Parsha of. Es Migdash Tiro, because earlier in the same parsha, the Torah uses the same words, Eshab Sosai Tishmoru, and that gives me an analogy between Shabbos and Migdash. And just like in the case of Shabbos, I am afraid, I am in awe, I will not violate Shabbos because I, by doing so, I will undermine the will of God. So, too, my obligation vis a vis the Migdash is not. To the Migdash itself, which would therefore imply that Mora Migdash is to be fulfilled by bowing down to the Migdash, but rather my year is towards Misha Hizir Allah Migdash. Now, I understand in the case of Shabbos that when the Torah says Ani Hashem, it's Mi Misha Hizir Allah Shabbos Ato Misyore, which means don't violate the Shabbos. You have 39 Malachas. And you have to see these 39 malachas as Yira of Hashem, not Yira of Shabbos, the entity of Shabbos, but by desecrating the Shabbos, Chas Shalom, I will violate the Yira that I have for Hashem, who created the Shabbos. But in the case of Migdash, what does it mean as Migdash Tiro? You told me what it doesn't mean, but you didn't tell me what it did, does mean. So it doesn't mean to bow down to the Migdash. So how do I fulfill Yira Sam Migdash? What we call the mitzvah Mora Migdash, which is one of the Tariq mitzvahs. And we got to find something that's parallel to Mora Shabbos. That when the Torah says that Eshav Sosei Tishmoru, and I have a mitzvah Shmir at Shabbos to observe the Shabbos and not to violate one of the 39 malachas, then in a parallel way, I have a mitzvah of Shmir Asa Migdash. So how does that mitzvah of Shmir Asa Migdash express itself? There are no 39 malachas. The Ezu, he Mora Migdash, and there are a group of Isurim that apply visibly the Migdash, and are generated by the midst of Mora Migdash. Lo yikari sadim barabais b'maklo, b'min olo, b'fundaso, u'biavaksha al gabirad. Person should not, now. Here we have a long discussion about Arabites. I mean, the Torah mentions the Migdash, it doesn't mention the Arabites. But in any event, leaving that question on the side, the Me'iri, by the way, says we should not take this price so literally. It doesn't really mean Harabites. It means that part of the Harabites that sanctified the Kedush as Migdash. And he says that's me Pesach, Hazara, me Bifnim. And the Brysa mentions Harabayas because of an Isra de Rabbanon. The Rabbanon expanded the um, area of Migdash on a Rabbanon level beyond the Azara in order to avoid violating Mora Migdash by doing these kinds of activities beyond the Pesach of the Azara. But says the Miri, they're two different deals. There's one din of the Azara, and there's another din of the Harabites. The din of the Azara, Moravigosh, is the Raisa, and all these Isurim are the Raisa, whereas the dinim of Mora Harabais, those are all the Rabbanon. Bimaklo, Bimin Olo, Obipundosa. Now, I understand Maklo. Maklo means he's carrying a staff. You know, when you when you move around amongst people, I don't know if it's a person who has uh, problems with his walking problems, but, you know, people in those days used to carry a staff. 
I mean, the Brits call it a stop, right? I have an acquaintance who collects old staffs. It's like his hobby. You walk into his house and he shows you a room. It's almost like a museum. You can't imagine the artwork that went into making staffs. This was a way a person showed off his, you know, his wealth with a staff. I understand in Olo because, you know, when Moshe Rabbeinu gets to the Har Chorev at the snare, HaKadosh Baruch says, Shal na'alcham So we take off our shoes as a matter of respect. But what's this business about Pundasam? And all I can tell you is that they wore certain kinds of belts, not like our belts, just to keep your pants from falling. They wore belts that had a hollow in it. And they would put their money into the belt. We call it a money belt. You can still see it today. Some people wear money belts. Mm -hmm. And that's not proper behavior or attire when you go into the Migdash whether it's the Harabais, Mirabonon, or the Azor Doraisa. In a philosophical sense, I would say that it means you're entering into a world of spirituality. So leave behind you all your materialism, your fancy staffs and your shoes, which connect you to this physical ground. Leave behind you your money, money belts. Again, where you'd put them, I guess you'd leave them at home and lock them up. And if you're staying in an inn, you better be careful and make sure that the, you know, if you want to leave it at the, at, you know, people leave things for security purposes at the, uh, at the front desk. Do you gentlemen know what I'm talking about here? What am I talking about? Yesterday's daf yom. <laughs> All right, so I'm make sure. Because yeah. Ramea was dashing the, 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 the name, and he understood from the name that you can't trust this guy. Anyway. And now we get to Bavakshal Gabi Ragnov. So he's got dusty feet and he's going barefoot. He should make sure to wash off his feet before he comes into the Azorah. Not only that, Lo Yasenu, Kapandria. Kapandria is a shortcut. So you can't get into the Harbayas in order to get to a certain place that you want to get to, but you're really not interested in going into the Harbayas. You're just using it as a shortcut. And by the way, a lot of these halachas, not all of them, will apply also to Beis HaKnesses. Shoes is a different story because that has to do with Shechina and Migdash. But other halachas that deal with, you know, the proper attire for a place that's sanctified, they will apply to our Migdash Ma'at. Urikika. Now, this is very problematic. Rikika, he's not allowed to spit on the Harabites. Why not? I mean, you have saliva in your mouth, so, you know, do it in a nice way. I remember I was at Mincha and I stood behind the Lubavitcher Rebbe, and he, you know, the Lubavitchers, when they get to Hamish uh, Tachmim, he spits. I wanted to see how the Rebbe does it. It was unbelievable. It was like the most edel kind of thing. You know, you got exactly controlled exactly how much saliva and it would drop down. It was like really beautiful. <laughs> In any event, so why is it also to, to, um, to spit on the Harabites? So all I can tell you is the Bryce says, Mikal v'chomer. Mikal v'chomer. But the Bryce doesn't spell out exactly what the Kal v'chomer is. Is there a Kal v'chomer that's based on the fact that you can't wear shoes and certainly you can't spit? So if you take a look at Rashi, four lines down from the top, he quotes a sugya in Mesech de Brachos. And the sugya there explains this Kalvachom. And this has to do with Megillus Esther. In the fourth chapter, it says, and I quote, He ain laval chara melt levush sak. A sackler. And that's why Mordechai couldn't enter into the child Melech after he heard about the Xer of Hormon. He was wearing a sackcloth to Prabha Velus. And if you can't wear a sackcloth, 
which is still a garment of some sort, it's not despicable. But Rashi says, Kalafomolo Ruk Shu Mos Lufnea Kodishbo. And it could be that if you were in the presence of a human being, you would not spit. How much more so the presence of the king of kings, you know, the Mokma Shras Hashkina, the Besam Bigdash, which is our connection to the higher spheres. So Rikika is considered Ma'usa, it's considered repulsive behavior. The question that I have is what about in a Besam Knesset? Okay, I don't have access to that now. But we, we really should, uh, at some point, if we have time, you know, check this out in Shulchan Aruch. Where would it be in Shulchan Aruch? Let's look in the Ein Mishpah. Uh, the Ein Mishpah is not going to tell you because he's not jumping to Beis HaKnesset. This price is only about Beis HaMikdash. But again, it wouldn't be hard to find it. I think it's in the second volume of the Mishnah Guru. Hilchus Beis Best of my knowledge, you're allowed to spit in a base hakness. So again, you know, there's a certain um, mora that's generated by the Melech Malchi Abmachim in the Migdash, and there's a certain mora that's generated by a Mokom Tefillah, where we bring the Shechina for our prayers, but it's not it's not the abode of the Melech Malchi Amloch. It's not his capital, his palace. I mean, Chazal say that after the Churban, HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself Kaviyach was crying because he didn't have a house to live in. <coughs> okay. Again, I'm always trying to improve my knowledge of, of the technology. In any event, so now we have, again, we'll go on to see the end of the price, but we have a clear understanding that as Mikdashi Tiro generates a whole slew of Isurim, similar to the Malachas of Shabbos, in both cases, our Mora is for Misha Hizir al Shabbos, or Misha Hizir al Migdash. So our awe is for the Almighty who is there in the Mikdash. And one is tempted to think, but again, this is more philosophy or Ashkofa, that even Shabbos means I have awe for the Rebbeinah that Shabbos is like the Mikdash, and Shabbos in Zman generates Shechina. Now that we don't have the Migdash, do we still have these same obligations that emanate from Es Migdashi Tiro to the Mokama Migdash? And if you'd ask me, okay, you didn't ask me, but I'll, I'll answer anyway. Um, why, why am I obligated in Mora Migdash if there is no Migdash? So the answer is there are two different categories of sanctity. There's what's called Kedushas Mokom, and there's Kedushas Mechitzos. Mechitzos means the walls that surround an area that's dedicated for Shechina, or for Kedusha. However, Kedushas Mokom means that that area on the face of the earth is sanctified even beyond Kedushas Mechitzos, and even in the absence of Kedushas Mechitz. So that even if the Migdash as a physical structure is destroyed, but the Makom as an abstract place, a location without Mechitzos, is endowed with Kedushas. In the case of the Beis HaKnesses, in the synagogue, the Kedusha exhausts itself in Kedushas Mechitzos. So if a, if a, a synagogue is destroyed, Chas then the Mako itself, where the, where the shul stood, has no sanctity. In that sense, a Beis HaKnesset is very similar to what? Not Migdash, because we're going to say the Migdash has Kedushas Mokom, but... No, I'm saying that 
our Migdash Ma'at, which is the Beis HaKnesset, should not be equated with the Beis HaMigdash, which has an addition to Kedushas Mechitzos, has Kedushas Makom, and therefore even the Churbana, you still have the Mora Migdash in that Makom, in Beis HaKnesset, as for Shalom, after Churban, the Makom is not Kadosh, because Beis HaKnesset is similar to what? What do I have in mind? Mishkan, right? There's a difference between Migdash and Mishkan. Mishkan doesn't have Kedushas Makom. Once you pack out and you fold up the Mishkan, which was the job of the Levian, and you reassemble the Mishkan in another place, then at that moment in time, when you have the Mechitzas of the Mishkan, then the Makom is sanctified by the Mechitzas. But once you take upon the <coughs> Mishkan, that Makom has no Kedusha whatsoever. And therefore, when Moshe Rabbeinu leaves the snare, there's no Kedusha. When Klal Yisrael leave with the Torah, again, they ran away a little prematurely, like Katino Kaborea, but the Makom of Harsinai has no Kedusha. My father told me that in his shtetl, where he was born in the city of Plisa City, with 70 Jewish families. Anyway, but in Plisa, it was a Jew whose entire life his dream was to go to Har Sinai and bow down. So Rafraden, who was the rub of the city, he said to this guy, instead of running to Har Sinai, why don't you stay here and please and observe the mitzvahs of the Torah? He was giving him a stop. But the truth is that if somebody would find Har Sinai today, it has no sanctity whatsoever. The sanctity of the Beis Hamikdash was only temporary. As long as they the sanctity of Harsina was temporary as long as the Torah was being given to Harsina. But Migdash is different. Migdash has Kedushas Mokka as an abstract concept without Mechitos. We may need the Mechitos to set up Kedushas Mokka. So, for example, David Amelech purchased the area of the Migdash, but he hadn't yet built the basin. Only Shlomo built the basin. So the actual Kedushas Mokka might depend, I mean, that's a sugya, on the mechitzos, but once you have the mechitzos, the mechitzos generate a kedushas makom, and even in the absence of the mechitzos, after churban, like the makom of the harbais today, there's no mikdash. Nevertheless, there's kedushas makom. Man shein beis hamikdash kaim minolan. How do we know that the bits of mora mikdash and the sanctity of the makom of mikdash still exist today? Even after Churban, Tabad Lomar, Eshab Sosai Tishmoru, Umikdashai Tiro. There's again an analogy in which Shabbos, because of its contiguity with the parish of Migdash, it's shedding a light about the Migdash. Mash Mira Mura Shabbos Likolo. Shabbos is not a Kedushas Mokom, it's not a Kedushas Mechitos, it's a Kedushan Zman. And that Kedushan Zman is not dependent at all on Mokom, on Mechitzos, on Migdash. So too, there's an element of Kedushas Migdash which is independent of the structure of the Migdash. Af Mora Hamura B'Migdash, we Olam, we are obligated in awe of the Migdash, whether it's what we call B'Binyano or even B'Churbano. Now, if this be the case, you know, those who go up to the Harabais today, they have to get some sort of a, a header for that because we're all Becheskes Tmein and we don't have access to the Mechados have Hazor B'Shvi, B'Shlishi, B'Shvi so I don't know exactly what, what the header is to go up on the Harabais. So please don't misunderstand me. That's not a political comment. You know, as far as my politics is concerned, I think we should go up to the higher box. But that's a political statement. As far as halakhic statement is concerned, I have serious issues with going up to the higher bias. Maybe there's certain parts of the higher bias which are not sanctified, and you'd have to be Rav Tukachinsky to know that. He was the expert on, you know, the various parts of the higher bias. In any event, the Pasuk of Mikdash Tiro 
has nothing to do with the Easter of Binyan Beis Hamikdash and Shabbos. That we're going to derive from Eshav Sosei Tishmar by Kibura. And therefore, we don't have in Mikdash Tiro a source of basis for the conclusion that an essay could override a lap sheshbo karis. We only have the possible by Kriya Chma, excuse me, by Kibura Ha'em. And there we have a principle called Heksher Mitzvah. You derive that the halach of Dechia would apply even without a Heksher Mitzvah in the case of Yibu. From the extra words, Ani Hashem in the Pesach Es Mikdosh Tiro. But now I need the Pesach Es Mikdosh Tiro for a whole different slew of Isurim that have nothing to do with Shabbos. So it's interesting that the Gemara has really shifted, I would call it a hundred degree shift in its understanding of the words Ani Hashem in the Pesach Es Mikdosh Tiro. Initially, the Gemara thought, Ani Hashem means that you don't build the Mikdash on Shabbos. The Gemara now is throwing that out. I know that you don't build the Mikdash on Shabbos. I don't, I don't bake for my father a, a bread on Shabbos. I don't build the Mikdash on Shabbos. And an essay, no matter how significant and great it might be, cannot override the Shabbos. So why then does the Torah tell Mikdash Tiro, Ani Hashem? The Ani Hashem is telling you that you don't bow down to the Mikdash. But now I need a posse against Mikdash Tiro to teach me that I don't spit on the base of Mikdash. In the book of Mikdash, I don't wear my shoes. I don't wear my money belt. I don't bring my staff in. All those Isurim are derived from this posse against Mikdash Tiro. As far as being Docha Shabbos, I'm left with one posse. And there, the uh, I can only determine that that we're talking about the Chia in the case of a Heksha Mitzvah. Okay. So now the Gemara is looking for a source for essay Dochalosa Sashish Bokares to justify Oleha in the case of Yibam Bachos. Ela Salkadait Chavina, if not for the Pasuk Oleha. I would have thought tasting me Avvara. Let's learn it from Shreifas Paskoi. The ton of the baby Rabbi Shmuel. Lo sevaro eish bechol moshe v'sech miyom hashabbos. My tamu lomar. What is the Torah coming to teach me? After all, it says lo sasakom malacha. And one of the thirty-nine malachas is Havara. So why the Torah has to single out Havara and repeat it? Lo sevaro eish bechol moshe v'sech miyom hashabbos. Now, what, what, what bothers my mind here is Havara is, is radically different than all the other 38 Malachas. I don't know. For example, a fire, by definition, is destructive. Ah, maybe that's not so. He, he lights a fire in order to cook food on, on the fire. Now, at this point, the Gemara sort of injects a question without even, without even allow the Bryce to finish. It's kind of like, you know, you read part of the Bryce and then you take a pause in order to explain that part of the Bryce that you read. And the Gemara says, Matal with Lomar, you're asking, Why do I need the posse of Los Savaro I'll give you an answer. Either Rabbi Yossi Lila for either Rabbi Nosan Lechal. So Rabbi Yossi holds that Malach, that Havar is not a Malach. We've reduced the number of Malachas from 39 to 38. Yossi is going to have to face that music. Find another malach. But Rabbi Yossi subtracts Havara from the list of 39 malachs. Why does he do so? Because the Torah says, 
if Havara, lighting a fire, was included at the low Sasako Mulachim, then just like the other 38 Mulachas, which the Torah doesn't bother spelling out, why would the Torah bother the spelling out Havara? And the answer is the Torah is taking Havara out of the bag of Mulachas and putting it into a very unique category that, as far as I know, has two members. And that is a separate lav, like Machaber, on Shabbos, but it's not a Mulachim. That's called the lav Yotzis. Yotzis means it was taken out of the definition and the category of Malok. However, we have Rabbi Nassim. Rabbi Nassim is of the opinion that we would derive Havara as one of the 39 Malokas, but the reason why the Torah repeated specifically this Malokha is to teach me Lechal. So what does L'chalik mean? Let's say if a person eats chalev, mishogig, he brings a karma chatos. What if, and how much did he eat? He has to eat a kezayis. So at time T1, he ate a kezayis of chalev. I have a karma. Now at time T2, let's say an hour later, he eats another kezayis of chalev. So how many chatos does he bring in that case? One or two? 50% chance you get the right answer. <laughs> Correct. He only brings one. Why? Because he repeated the same Avera twice. And the halacha is that if there was one halama, meaning there was no Yediyah Machalekes, no one told him, hey, buddy, you were eating Chalev, or hey, maybe you didn't know this, but Chalev is awesome. So he had one halama, one forgetfulness that combined the same Avera over. But here's case number two. He ate down at T number one, time T number one. That's also a few of Kharis and a few of uh, Khatas. And at time T two, he ate Khalif. How many Khatos does he bring now? Two. Why? Because he violated two different Isuri. Even though it was one halam, there was never an idea in between that, oh no, what did I do? I ate that. What happens if a person violates the Shabbos? two different malachas. If he violates the same malacha twice, he did a ketzira here, and then he did a ketzira here, he only brings one chatos. But if he did a ketzira and a harisha, behelim achas, says Rav Nossin, he has to bring two chatos. And it's as if he ate dam and he ate chelot. Two different isur. That's wild. Counterintuitive. In both cases, he violated the same Easter of Shabbos. Why shouldn't one chat suffice? The answer is Lo Savaro The Torah took this malacha out of the bag <clears throat> in order to teach you a that every malacha is an entity and an Easter unto itself. So if you violate two malachas, you violate two Easter. The Torah gave us a short form. Instead of saying, thou shalt not reap, thou shalt not thresh, thou shalt not sow. The Torah said, don't do malach. But that's just the short form. Take the word malach and now fill in each malach of the 39, lo tasu x, malach x, malach y. Each malach is a separate entity, a separate issue. And says Rabbi Nossam, that's what we derive from the possible of Savaro Eish And you can imagine how angry he is at Rabbi Yossi, because Rabbi Yossi took Avara out of the 39 Malachas. person lights a fire on Shabbos, according to Rabbi Yossi, will give him lashes. That's what I did. But according to Rabbi Nossam, he lights a fire on Shabbos. If he did it, he gets skewer. It's one of the Malachas. We pass like Rabbi Nossam. So therefore, the brysa that we started with now makes no sense. The brysa asks the question, Ma Talmud Lomar, why do I need the possible Zavara Eish B'chom And there are two different answers, two different opinions as to why we need that possible. But with it, either way, we need the possible. Either to downgrade it from the level of a malacha to the level of a lav, or to teach me a more bombastic finish, that every malacha has its own chiv chatos, chiluk malachas. 
The Sanya we learned in the Brisa, Avar lelav yotzis dimei Reb Yosi, Reb Nosen Omer lechalit. So now we go back to try to shed a light on this brisa. On my Rava, Rava says, what was the meaning of this brisa? Rabbi, Rabbi Shmuel had a brisa, but he wasn't, he wasn't meaning to say that the posik is, is redundant. Of course, we have, we have a lot to learn from this posik also of our age, almost either a lav or a lechal. But Tana Debei, Rabbi Shmuel, and the brisa, is Moshavos, the language of Moshavos, for example, it says, Lo Sivaru Eish Bechol Moshavos Sechem. Ma'atamad Loma. What is the Torah teaching me by telling me that the Violation of, of Havar on Shabbos applies to Chol Moshe But was there a Havar meaning that if I'm in Africa or I'm in Asia or America, I would not be enjoined from lighting a fire? So the Gemara says, Michti Shabbos Chovas HaGrufi. Chovas HaGruf no Hegis Bein Boritz Bein B'chutz Lartz. In Palestine, that's sanctified. I could be in Africa. I could be in America. It doesn't matter where I am. We're talking about a Chobos HaGruf. This is a mission, by the way, in Kedushin. So therefore, most Shabbos, the Kos Rachman of Shabbos, lovely. Why, why would I even have a Hamamina that outside of the bounds of Eretz Israel, there is no Shabbos, as far as Havara is concerned. Now we understand very well Matam and Lomer in the Brisa. Why did the Torah have to add the words Bechol Moshe Those are redundant. I would never have a Havamina to say that Shabbos is a Mitzvah Tliya Ba'aretz because it's not a Chobas Karka, it's a Chobas Agu. So now what do we learn from Bechol Moshe Vosecha? Mishum Rabbi Shmuel Omar Tamad Echol. The fish in them are the chiyye ba'ish chet mishpat moves v'humas. So there's a mitzvah, a mitzvah say, to put to death someone who's condemned to death in a Jewish court. Shomayani, I might entertain the possibility of bain bechol bain b'shabes that Benson should put this person to death even on Shabbos, and the essay of of punishment, I mean the obligation to punish the sinner, the criminal, should override the law of Shabbos. So we what's the mani makai? Like the Torah says, Machalemos Yumas. I didn't see any Rashi on Mani Makayim. What's Mani Makayim? Oh, I got it. The Mani Makayim means the following. You're telling me that the Torah added to teach me that 
Bezdu would not put a condemned criminal to death on Shabbos. Because I have a Havamina that when the Torah commands us and Bezdin at the head of it to put to death a condemned criminal. That mitzvah applies Bein B'Shabbos or Bein B'chol. I, the Torah says, what do you mean B'Shabbos? How could Bezdin put someone to death on Shabbos? After all, the Torah says, Mechalem Os Yumos. That you're not allowed to be Mechal Shabbos. So if you're going to put someone to death on Shabbos, then you're violating a Malacha. So the answer is Bishar Malachas, Chutzmi Misas Bez. When the Torah says Machalemos Yumas, it's not including, it's not referring to Misas Bez. So as far as Misas Bez is concerned, there's no possible Machalemos Yumas. And therefore, I would maintain that we should put him to death, whether it's on Chol or on Shabbos, because the Torah is taking this mitzvah out of the bed. Of Kamalacha Losas, Mechalel Mosimus. See, what I don't understand is how does he derive this from the Chomosh Vosecha? I'm thinking out loud that since Bezdin had a separate area where they sat, let's say the Bezna Gadol. Sat in the Lushka Sagazes, that's called the Moshavas. And the Torah had to say that don't use Srefa, which is just paradigmic of one of the one example of four different types of categories of this. Don't put to death a criminal on shops. Now, where and who and where would put him to death in the Havamina? It would be Bezdin. And Bezdin is like a separate motion. They live, they occupy the Lishkas Hagosis outside the Migdash. So I might think that in that area, the Mitzvah and the Mitzvah of Misa's Bezdin, Lohamis S. Hamafuy of Misa, and even on Shabbos they should fulfill. I, the Torah says, Machalev Mosimas, and you're violating Malach and Shabbos. That's in other Malachs, but not the Malacha. Of based in putting someone to death. So what I'm understanding here is Kamash Malan that the Pasik therefore los los of our age is to teach me even in Bezdin, even in Moshe of Bezdin, there will not be a violation of the shops for the sake of the mitzvah of, of putting a criminal to death. Oh Eno. Ela filu misas bezdin. Or shall I argue to the contrary that even misas bezdin is prohibited on Shabbos? In other words, a Mrs. Asay cannot override the Shabbos. According to this O Eno L. And that's because Shabbos the Lav Shish Bom Karitz. So again, how, how are we learning from this that Essay Dokalosa Shish Bom Karitz? Ah, maybe because there was a Havamina that the mitzvah of Mises Bezdin would override the Shabbos, even though Shabbos is a Lav Sheish Bokares. But the implication is that any other essay would override a Los Sheish Bokares. Hence, we have a source for the need for a Leha in the case of Yibam of Achosish.
okay. okay. so I understand to mean that maybe there is a Havamina Svar to say that Bezdin should execute a criminal on Shabbos. And that's for the sake of the mitzvah of Misas Bezdin, but in general, we Right, I think the in general here means when there's no mitzvah. Here there's a compelling mitzvah of Mises Bezin, and that's going to override the shops. Again, in the Havamin, before the Pesach of Chomosh uh, Hosef. Talmud Lomar. So what are we going to do with the Pesach Moshe Hosef? Huh? Lo sevar eish b'chol Moshe Sechem, v'chein lahalon in the chiv misus pesim for otzeh who omer v'hoyu ela lachem luchukas mishpat lid doro sechem b'chol Moshe Sechem, and that's a pasuk in the parsha of misas harotzeh that we put the murderer to death. And now we have Xavier Shavok sorts. We have Umamo Shavos Hamurim Lahalon in Rotzeh. Is Bebezdin, so the word Moshavos means Bezdin. And that's where there's a chiv upon Bezdin to put to death a Rotzeh. Is Af Moshavos Hamuros Khan. In the case of Avoras, Eish b'chol Moshe Sechem b'bezdin. So the Gzair Shavah tells me that Moshe Shavos is referring to bezdin. So in other words, somebody is condemned to death and should be put to death with strafe. And you'd have to light a fire in order to put this person to death. They used to uh, heat up a small piece of metal and uh, they would make it into molten leather and lead and pour it down the person's throat, etc., etc. So, regarding this Havara, Omar Achman lo Sevaru Eish Bechomosh Hosechem, even in Bez. So, we see from this Brysa that the premise was that for the sake of the mitzvah of Bezdin to put to death the contempt of violator, we would override the Shabbos. It must be that we're operating with Essay Dokolosa, and it's a Losa Seshish Bokos. Now, I'm tempted to think, tell me if you agree with me, that again, we're talking about Hechshad Mitzvah. Because if the Torah commands Bezdin to put to death a person with Shreifa, then there's no possibility on Shabbos of fulfilling that essay without violating the law. I mean, even if you were to burn the fire before Shabbos, you know, light the fire, but still, when you take the fire to heat up the metal on Shabbos, then you're violating the law of Havara. And yet there's a Havara, meaning that you would do that even on Shabbos for the sake of the mitzvah of Misa's Bez. So the Torah is telling us that in this particular case of Shabbos, we will not allow an essay to override the Shabbos. But as a universal rule, we will allow an essay to violate Alos HaSashi Bokaris. So we have the same severity as Shabbos, but it's not Shabbos. And yet the essay would override it. The, the, the Torah is telling me the essay can't override Shabbos. But I'll argue that's only Heksha Mitzvah. 
But we already have Eshab Sosit Tishmani Hashem in the case of Kibbutz. So again, Rashi is going to argue that it's redundant in the parsha of Visa Spez the Misrefa. And it must be telling me that even if it's not a Hepshah, it's like the case of Yibu with that whole speech. So we're up to my lot. Now we're really smack in the middle of the sugya, but we ran out of time. And I, I did accomplish most of what I had in mind for today because I felt that we, as I said at the beginning of the year, it might be Kedai to now make a little bit of progress so we get into some of the Imamah Sugis. You know, we've been dealing with Essay Dokhalosas. So that's where we're going to make a note of that. That's where we got up to. And uh, that's it. Okay, then? What, what did they used to have at the end of the cartoons? That's all folks or something? Like that? Oh, yeah, that's all folks. I mean, I haven't heard that in about 60 years. <laughs> Tomorrow's my English birthday. <laughs>